All right, chapter 11. Now, after Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he moved on from there to teach and preach in their towns. Once again, he is methodically teaching, uh, preaching. And while John was in prison, he heard about the things Christ was doing. And he sent two of his disciples to ask him, are you the coming one or should we wait for someone else? Probably going to spend some time on this. Um, first of all, John was in prison across or beyond the Dead Sea. There was a, a fortress there. We're told this in the Gospel of Mark, which fortress he was in, Machiris, and it was one of Herod's palaces. Um, and it was kind of far away, but John had heard about what Jesus was doing. And before we talk about why he sent two of his disciples, I want to talk about the coming one. Um, and I have a, <laughs> a, a, a list on the front page of your handout of some prophecies of the, prophecies rather, of the coming one. Um, so I'd like to go through some of these. Not everything, I don't have a slide for everything on the list because some of them are duplicates, okay? But if you're the kind of person who wants to write down little helps for each one, you can, I'll try to take time if you want to do that or let me know if I'm going too fast. But these are um, these passages. And by the way, I just got these by looking at the footnotes of my NIV Bible. Just, you know, they're, they're down there. Where, where is an Old Testament passage that's reflected by this New Testament event? They're usually footnoted. So if, uh, Genesis 3.15 is the seed of Eve who would crush Satan, right? I will put enmity between you and the woman. Then Genesis 49.10 is the scepter will not depart from Judah. This is a prophecy given by Jacob or Israel about his son. Then Exodus 12 and Numbers 9, none of his bones will be broken. So we see that uh, referred to in the, in the crucifixion scene. And then Deuteronomy 18, where Moses says, the Lord will raise up a prophet like me. So he will be a prophet. And last week in um, my email devotions on Zechariah, we also saw that the, the Savior would be both um, priest and king in one man. So Moses says he'll be a prophet. The Lord tells Zechariah he'll also be at the same time as prophet. He'll be priest and king. And how can that be in the same individual? Well, God shows the prophet how that can be and goes on from there. I'm going to turn my page. It's a big page. I won't yet. Psalm 22 begins. Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Psalm 22, 7. Um, he trusted in God that he should deliver him. Let him deliver him if he delights in him. The mockery of the Savior, which is quoted um, amazingly, quoted almost verbatim by the Pharisees at Jesus' own crucifixion and by the priests. And then at the end of Psalm 22, they divided his garments without tearing them. So they played uh, dice for the, for the clothing of the Lord at the foot of the cross. Psalm 31 into your hands I commit my spirit. Um, and Psalm 41, my friend who has shared my bread will betray me. Okay. Can I go to the next slide? We got one more. Ginger, tell me to stop or go. It's okay. Go? Okay. All right. Then uh, some more from the Psalms. Psalm 69, zeal for your house consumes me. Remember, the disciples remembered this after Jesus flipped the tables um, in, the, in the temple. And Psalm 78, I will open my mouth in parables. So the promise that this is the way that he would teach and preach. It's a couple from Psalm 118, the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone or the keystone. When David wrote this, Psalm 118, the idea of a capstone in, a, in an arch had probably only just been invented. And David says that's what the Savior will be like. Because um, the, 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 the um, architectural engineering amazement of, that, of an arch with a capstone is, and Mr. Oppitz, correct me if I'm wrong about this, it sends the weight of the building above down the arch itself and into the ground. 
So as long as that top stone is accurate and correctly cut, it will stand. In fact, there are arches in, uh, in Europe, in, in, uh, in Rome, in Greece, and so forth, where the arch is the only thing in the building still standing. But these arches are still standing because they're built so well. And by the way, no mortar, no, no nothing. Just stone on top of stone on top of stone with practically no seam, just built perfectly. And the arch will just stand. Um, that's why the Romans used them to build their, uh, their water systems. The little channel for the water would be held up by arches, just arch upon arch upon arch upon arch. What's that called? An aqueduct. Yeah, that's all it is. Of course, the Romans transported poison along with their water because what was their channel lined with? Lead. Yeah. So, it's smooth, it's easy to work with, it's everywhere, let's just use lead. Yeah, well, nice job. Okay. They didn't know. Uh, Later in Psalm 118, Blessed is he, I have a typo there, who comes in the name of the Lord. We have a, the, the, what the people will sing at, the, at, at uh, Palm Sunday. Um, in Isaiah 6, be ever hearing, never understanding. That goes along with the parables. Why did he speak in parables? So that unbelievers would hear them and not understand them correctly. All kinds of evidence of that still happening today. When unbelievers don't understand a parable. It's when an unbeliever takes it on himself to write a commentary that he really starts to mess people up. Because then nobody will, people will try to use the commentary and, well, how did he get this? Well, all you got to do is not have faith. A bunch from Isaiah. The virgin will be with child. So Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. That's the beginning of the, of the John the Baptist prophecies. Isaiah 32, the king will reign in righteousness. I skipped a psalm. Psalm, what is it? 95 or 96, the Lord reigns. And there are some early church fathers who comment <clears throat> that they saw Hebrew texts of that where it clearly said the Lord reigns from a tree. And now all the, all the Hebrew copies they see have that missing from the from a tree part. The Lord reigns. There's, that's a, that's a, I talked about that when I did the psalm in, in, the, uh, in the Sunday morning Bible class a couple years ago. <clears throat> uh, Isaiah 35, the eyes of the blind will be opened. We'll look at that again when we talk about fulfilled prophecies. And then Isaiah 40, prepare the way for the Lord. Um, the voice of him who crieth in the wilderness, right? Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the, in the desert a valley, or make straight, yeah, in the desert, a highway for our God. Um, I'm sorry, I'm quoting more from Handel than I am from Isaiah 40 there. Um, and then uh, uh, Isaiah 42, Jesus himself liked to quote this one, a bruised reed he will not break. A, how does it end? A smoking wick he will not snuff out. Yeah. Isaiah 52 uh, and 53, two chapters about the suffering servant. Um, and with his stripes we are healed and so forth. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Um, did you know that in the current um, Saturday um, series of lessons in synagogues, like our Sunday morning lessons, we have the same gospel lessons week after week out of a three-year cycle. That's based on the, on, the, on the Jewish synagogue system of doing a three-year cycle with their Old Testament passages. Um, um, you had a Moses lesson, a Psalm, and then a prophet lesson, typically. Um, uh, in all of that, though, in the last 2,000 years, Isaiah 52 and 53 is omitted from the lessons in the synagogues. They don't read it. Um, at least in all the copies I've seen that are posted online. You know, this is what we do, this is what our readings are this month and so forth. Um, I followed the lessons of, of, one, synag- of one rabbi 
who was in uh, Jerusalem in the, in the uh, first decade of the 2000s. And um, I, th- I, I, I can't find him anymore. I kind of think maybe he was killed in, a, in one of those missile attacks from the, from the Palestinians. I'm not sure what happened to him. Or maybe he retired or something. He didn't seem like he was that old. Um, okay, then Isaiah 61, the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor and so forth. Jeremiah 7, you have made this house a den of robbers, a den of thieves. Um, Jeremiah 31, Lord, save your people. Why is that significant? Well, Lord, save is the meaning of the name Jesus. The Lord saves. Then Jeremiah 31, a voice is heard in Ramah, Rachel weeping for her children. What terrible story does this get connected to in the New Testament? The slaughter of the innocents in, in Bethlehem, that's right. We move to a couple in Daniel, although there are more in Daniel. We could have, we could have done a dozen just from Daniel. But one like the Son of Man, I, I see him coming down from the sky. And then twice in Daniel 9, we have until the anointed one comes. Anointed in Hebrew is Messiah. So the actual title of the, of the, of the Christ given there in Daniel Couple in Hosea, on the third day he will restore us. Uh, we don't often talk about that, but I see that as, a, as an Easter reference. And then Hosea 11, out of Egypt I called my son. When did God call his child out of Egypt? Well, twice. Once through Moses and once when Jesus got taken down to Egypt when Herod was trying to kill him. And then Jonah 1.17, in the belly of the fish, three days and three nights. Um, so Jesus himself uses that as a sign of Jonah. Um, family Bible night, three weeks ago in our adult vacation Bible school here at St. Paul's, I did the story of Jonah and shocked a couple of people by saying that the fish in Jonah could have been a whale. Didn't go over well with some. I, I, I don't like that sometimes pastors say it couldn't have been a whale because that just violates the way Moses describes animals. Moses only has five categories of animals. Wild animals, crawling animals, domestic animals, fish, and birds. And some fish are on the, uh, on the do not eat list in Leviticus 11. And the fish... That's Moses' word in Leviticus 11 that you can't eat are not the ones with scales and fins. So why do we call the fish that swallowed Jonah, why do we say that that couldn't be a fish just because a whale doesn't have scales and fins? It just violates scripture going back and forth. So I'm a little bit heated up a little bit about that but with people, but forgive me. My brothers should know better even from previous generations. All right, one, one more little the tail end of the list here. Might, maybe is an extra one I added, but Micah 5, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, a prophecy about where Jesus would be born. Haggai 2, 6 and 7, the desired of all nations will come. We talked about that in this class also and whether or not this means Christ himself because the desired of all nations is plural. The desired ones of all nations, could that be not Christ, but Christians being gathered in? Well, it can mean both. And Zechariah 9, riding into Jerusalem on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Zechariah 11, they paid me 30 pieces of silver. So even the price is listed in in the Old Testament. And Zechariah 12, they will look on the one they have pierced. Um, there, There are some who call the whole book of Zechariah the, um, the, the, the prophet of the crucifixion. That's pretty much a, a, a lot of what he talks about, especially in the second half of the book, is all about the crucifixion. And then Malachi, now going back to John the Baptist, I will send my messenger to prepare the way for him. So these are the kind, this is by no means an exhaustive list, and yet it, it's a pretty long list, isn't it? But this is, I hardly spend any time gathering this. 
I just flipped through my NIV and looked at the footnotes. Um, you could spend a lot of time on, on a much longer list of what, does the script, what do the scriptures tell us about the coming Savior and what he would be like. And there are all kinds of things about this, specific miracles that he would perform. So John sends two of his disciples to ask Jesus. Why did he send them to ask Jesus if he's the one who was supposed to come? Well, there are three, maybe four answers. And I'm just going to walk through those if you don't mind. So first, I think he had them ask Jesus for their own sakes, either to have the question answered by someone other than John with the hope that they might fall in line and maybe join Jesus' disciples. Um, this is what Luther thought, that it gave Jesus the opportunity to teach John's disciples directly so the gospel could work in their hearts. And we know that a couple of John's disciples, namely, I think James and John, did come over to Jesus and become his disciples. Um, and I like that one. I, a couple of these are, are, are worth looking at. I like this one especially. Next one, was John's own faith wavering? Um, there are some who talk about this, and I'm, I'm not a fan of this one. Um, John had seen the dove land on Jesus, right? He had heard the voice of the Father speaking. He had been specially chosen by God for that moment. And he understood his role clearly. He said, he must increase, I must decrease. Right? I don't think John's faith is wavering here. So I think it's, I think it's something different. Third one, though, was John's patience wavering? Was he expecting that Christ might clear his threshing floor of trash like Antipas and Herodias and get rid of some of this riffraff and clean things up? Well, um, first of all, uh, uh, um, what, what could have been more convincing than the Father's voice and the descending of the Holy Spirit as the dove? Um, that the, the, those miracles were being widely reported and they were ample evidence for everybody except those whose hearts were hard. And even some of the Sanhedrin had become believers in Jesus. Men like Joseph of Arimathea and, uh, and Nicodemus were, part, were members of the Sanhedrin. And what, was John's patience wavering? Um, what, was he now losing faith in the message he himself had proclaimed? Again, I... I, I I don't think that this is what was on John's mind. Um, and the last one is, had John only just begun to suspect that Jesus was Messiah? This was put forward about 150, maybe 200 years ago, during the 19th century, right before and right after the, the American Civil War is when this one got popular. Um, but I think it was put in there to, to, to discredit and do away with the story of Jesus' miraculous birth, that it was John the Baptist who made Jesus the Messiah, or something like that. But the fact is, it's easily dismissed by the facts of our text and of John's preaching. He recognized that Jesus was the Messiah way back when he baptized him. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So I don't buy into this one either. And of these four, I like this one the best, that... I think that for the sake of the disciples themselves, John sent them to listen to Jesus. You guys have questions? Go ask Jesus. If you're not listening to me. And also, maybe that they might, the part, part B of, of this um, in front of us here is that they might join Jesus. You, why are you guys hanging around this prison? You know, the guards will bring me water and an apple every day or whatever. You go follow Jesus now. I think that makes the most sense. Does anybody else have a, um, a question or a comment about this, though? Well, didn't Zacharias tell John? Well, sure. Yeah, his dad. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Zachariah told him, too. This is why you've come, my son, to prepare the way. And his mom. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, I like that so much, let's just move on. Well done. Jesus answered them. So this is now to the two disciples. Go report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the gospel is preached to the poor. Blessed is the one who does not take offense at me. So he sends them back to John with the answer. Um, and why have them repeat the answer? Why not just answer them? Well, how do you get people to memorize? You memorize 90% of what you teach. So you think about this and go and teach John. Pretty good way of getting them to put it into their own heads. Uh, make them go and say this. Um, uh, so we have a couple of references here to Isaiah. Four different uh, sections of Isaiah's book. Um, the first one, Isaiah 35. He will come and save you. The eyes of the blind will be opened. The ears of the deaf will be cleared. The lame will leap like a deer. And the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. That's just one verse or three verses rather of Isaiah. So it fits in really well, doesn't it? But let's look at the whole thing. So I have bits of Isaiah 26, 35, 52, and 58 on the right. And just what Jesus says here in Matthew 11 on the left. Does that make sense? So the blind receive sight. Isaiah 35, the eyes of the blind will be opened. The lame walk. Again, Isaiah 35, the lame will leap like a deer. Lepers are cured. There is no specific prophecy about the Savior healing lepers. I wonder if it was so un unheard of in the Old Testament that although, um, which prophet did cure a leper in the Old Testament? Do you remember? He was the one with a servant. Elisha. Elisha. Gehazi was his, was his, uh, his gopher, his yeoman, whatever you call that, a, a prophet's assistant. I don't think they would use, use the word yeoman in the Bible, though. But he was his, nor do they say gopher, but he was his um, servant. Um, and I, I say that because that's a big part of the story that we often don't teach. Nahum and the Syrian came, he got cured, and then how does that servant fit into the story? Naaman offered rewards to Elisha. And Elisha said, no, just go. And then Gehazi, the servant, runs after him and says, you know, uh, he changed his mind. We could, you could, you could. And then, what does, and then what does Elisha do to the servant? His leprosy will now cling to you. Shouldn't have been so greedy. Um, and, and that doesn't get cured. His servant is leprous for the rest of his life. Um, so that sticks to him. But there is uh, Isaiah 58, 8, your healing will appear. So there is healing prophesied, but specifically lepers, no. So Jesus is saying, I'm, I've, I've gone above and beyond what, what even Isaiah said I would do. But the deaf hear, so deaf ears are cleared and tongues of the mute will sing. Um, both deafness and muteness are often combined as an illness. They often go hand in hand. And the dead are raised. Your dead will rise, Isaiah 26. And the gospel is preached almost word for word. The good news or gospel will be preached, um, uh, Isaiah 52 also. So all of these things, just in Isaiah, we could have looked for them elsewhere. For example, in Jeremiah. But they're all in Isaiah here as well. So Jesus has done everything that was prophesied and even more. That's the point. So as these two now were leaving, Jesus began to talk to the crowds about John. What did you go out in the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Well, if you think about going out to the banks of the Jordan River, you might think about the you know, the reeds blowing on the, on the river bank. That's not what John was, though. Was he swayed by the wind? No. If, if you're going to compare John to something on the banks of the Jordan, would it be a reed or would it be a stone? A stone, yeah. He wasn't shaken by anybody. What did he go out to see? A man dressed in soft, or I think 
What did the old NIV here say? Luxurious or something? Rich clothing? Fine clothing? Soft is an interesting translation uh, choice here by the NIV 2011. It's not wrong. Um, but soft clothing. What kind of clothing did John wear? Camel hair. Yeah. Not exactly soft. Yeah. Um, I think that burlap would have been a step down. Would have been on the, on the, on the way to being soft for John rather than that. Um, and no, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. So what did you go out to see? Prophet? Yes, I tell you. And he is much more than a prophet. Everybody went out to see John because they had heard about prophets in their synagogue lessons. They knew the stories of the prophets. They knew about, uh, about uh, Joshua who said prophetic things. Samuel, David who said prophetic things. Is Saul also among the prophets? And then Gad, Nathan, uh, Obadiah who saved a hundred from the hands of wicked King Queen Jezebel, Elijah. Sorry, Elijah, Elisha, um, and the the four great prophets: Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and the twelve minor prophets, and all the others. There are many, many more. Um, and which one did I leave out? I did it on purpose to see if you if you'd catch it. Moses. And we, we often smile at that because Moses is in a class by himself. I, why would you class Moses as a prophet? He's so much more than a prophet. Well, yeah, that's just the point. And what about John? There hadn't been a prophet in Israel since Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi had died. Especially the younger ones, Zechariah and Malachi. Haggai was an older guy. Haggai is the one who says, I wept. When I saw the new temple, he had been around to see the old temple. And Haggai is, has a short, a short prophetic life. But Zechariah and Malachi, younger guys, they're around into the, maybe the 400s BC. Maybe the three with, with Malachi, maybe as late as 390, 380 BC. But then nobody for 400 years until John. Until John. And so everybody goes out to see John. When I was 10, can I give you a Star Trek analogy? When I was 10 years old, back in the days of four channels of TV, when PBS was still brand new, back in those days, uh, something happened after school. Um, local TV stations bought up Star Trek and started showing Star Trek after school every day and other classic television like The Munsters and I Dream of Jeannie and things like that. But, we, but if you got home, you could even go to, to baseball practice and make it home in time to see Star Trek at four. So that was just what we always did. And then what happened? Saturday mornings? New Star Trek showed up. They made a cartoon Star Trek with all the original actors as the voices, and it ran for two years. And we, and of course, we all swarmed around our, our all of our 10, 11 year old boys, swarmed around our TV sets to watch this, to drink it in, because we wanted to see more Star Trek. And we had to wait for 20 more years until anything else showed up, but we loved it at that moment. Um, and now imagine it, uh, there being no prophet in, in the world for 400 years. And then a prophet shows up. And of course the people swarmed out to see the prophet. And uh, 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 Matthew and Mark tell us that Galilee and Judea emptied because people went out to see uh, uh, the, 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 the forerunner of the Christ, to see him preach out at Enon on the Jordan, as John calls it. And uh, yeah, this is the one about whom it is written. Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Um, and Jesus continues, Amen, I tell you, among those born of women, there has not appeared anyone greater than John the Baptist. Yet whoever is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Let's look at the end of verse 11 there carefully. 
Is Jesus saying that John is not in the kingdom of heaven? No. No, John is a believer with faith. But John had a direct message from God, also from his dad, Larry reminded us, and from Christ himself. That's where, I mean, who taught John to baptize? God the Father. But where did you get your faith from? from? Did God the Father suddenly appear over your bed one night and shout the gospel into your ears? No, no, you got brought with baptism to faith and your faith grew even though you never saw Jesus, never heard the voice of the Father. Um, That's why you are greater than John. John had every advantage of, of having the message directly from God into his mind, into his heart. He had no choice. How soon was John leaping at the sound of the voice of of? Of, of God in the womb still. Um, John did that. Um, but you, you believe um, you, uh, 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 without having seen and heard. You, know, you didn't get to hear Jesus in person, didn't get to hear John preaching in person. Um, you were brought to faith the way that most are brought to faith. So greater than he. And you, my dear sisters and brothers, are not least in the kingdom of heaven. So, from the days of John the Baptist until now, Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven has been advancing forcefully and forceful people are seizing it. Now, what do we have? Seven minutes? Can I do this in seven minutes? What does that mean? Uh, first, let's do the first half. The, the kingdom of heaven has been advancing forcefully. Uh, that's a better word than violently. And I know that a couple of old translations like the Douay, maybe the King James said violently, but no, forcefully, with energy. Um, a better way of saying this. Uh, and from the days of John until now would only be a couple of years. So John, until when Jesus says this, in fact, a year and a half maybe? That's all we're talking about in this particular passage. Um, But the kingdom of heaven has been advancing forcefully. And now we're going to go back to something I I mentioned earlier. These prophecies about the Savior in Zechariah. Zechariah in chapter 6 calls the Savior the branch with a capital B. The branch. And he is going to branch out. And that's the kingdom of God branching out from the one out to everybody else. Advancing forcefully. So it's, it's going out. It's going to keep going out and keep going out. And there are going to be people who are in the kingdom of heaven who you, you wouldn't... How did they hear that in Australia, Antarctica, Finland, you know, Iowa all those exotic foreign places. Um, How did it get to them? Well, advancing forcefully. But now we have forceful people are seizing it. That is, seizing the kingdom of heaven. Now, that has a couple ways of being looked at. And which one does it mean? So, forceful people are seizing it. Could it mean that the kingdom suffers violence because of opposition? Violent men are seizing it. Could it mean that? There are many who have thought that that's what it means. Um, I'm not sure I like that one the best, but it sometimes is applied by Luther this way. Luther, by the way, applies it all three of these four, uh, three of these three ways. So I didn't have much help from him, except to confirm that yeah, you can see it all these ways then the kingdom could be monopolized by the powerful if it were not first preached to the poor. That is a fascinating look at this that I wouldn't have thought of myself. But that the reason the kingdom is preached to the poor is because if it were only preached to the wealthy and the, and the, and the powerful, they would grab hold of it and not let anybody else see it. 
this is ours and not yours. That's the entire doctrine of Gnosticism, that ancient heresy, which was we've got the secret, and who today is basically like the Gnostics? They have the secrets, they're not going to share them with anybody. The Masonic Lodge, the Masons. We have one of those in town. We have the secrets, and you can be initiated, but it's secrets. Um, so, uh, you know, I, um, but finally, Luther's uh, favorite way of applying this is the last one. Um, the kingdom is preached by forceful men. Not violent men, but by forceful men. Um, and this is how uh, Luther puts this one, this last one. He says, I must preach, but the devil offers resistance. Very well, preaching there must be, even if, it should be if, the world should be torn apart. These are the men of violence who take the kingdom of heaven by force. It's the energetic preaching that must carry out the kingdom of heaven um, and, 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 and uh, make sure that people hear the gospel and what's the violent, the forceful part of this? It's the preaching of the law. We must be told what our sins are so that we understand the need for the gospel. And what happened when John preached the, the law? John the Baptist? He got arrested and eventually got decapitated for it. Yeah. I happen to see... Um, as long as we're talking about decapitation, let's just stay on that for a second. I happened to see um, a, uh, a, a presentation of some of the greatest artwork of the, the, the man's name was Hans Holbein. And he was a German, I think he was a Catholic, but he was Luther's time. And he was from um, Augsburg. He was born in Augsburg or worked in Augsburg. Then he ended up in, in, um, in Britain and went to work for Henry VIII. And he became a famous uh, painter of portraits, but he had some amazing church um, altar pieces and things that he had also painted. And one of them was of the execution of St. Paul. And uh, he depicts this as St. Paul's head is laying on the floor, but upright, like, ta-da, with a crown, you know, and rays coming out of it and everything, he's sainted. And, there's, and, and what's disgusting is there's the body with squirts of blood, like it's right on a Monty Python. It was, just, it was just hideous. But there are three pools where there are um, the, the three spots on the floor because the legend was that when Paul's head came off, it bounced three times before it came to, I'm sorry, but and most of us are about to eat lunch, aren't we? But let's, let's keep going with this. Um, and that out of those three spots where his head touched were three fountains. Um, so the, the kind of thing you can do in artwork is amazing to sort of capture that. All in one simple painting is all of that legend, all of the same. And nothing you've ever heard before, is it? It's, it's, it's like, why, why would we even think about something like that? We just know that Paul was killed hideously, and since he was a Roman citizen, he could not be crucified. So, yeah, probably the way he died, but in that painting, there's all kinds. And of course, witnessing this is, um, uh, oh no, that's a different painting entirely, but Holbein liked to put himself into these paintings, but anyhow. I knew that we were coming to the end of our session, so I thought I would throw that out to you too. You're welcome. And no picture. You're even more welcome. <laughs> God bless you all. Have a good day. I'll see you next time. And thank you once again for letting me do this. You've been listening to Invisible Church, the Bible study podcast from St. Paul's Lutheran Church, New Wall, Minnesota.